Marcus for joining us in this uh, in this workshop. So I will brief, briefly introduce Marcus, Dr. Marcus Gloss. Gloss. Uh, so Marcus uh, is going to share us, uh, as you may read, experience with controlled mesoscale experiment, inherent uncertainty, machine learning to the rescue. So Dr. Gross has more than 20 years of experience in scientific computation and high performance computing. Before joining CISESE four years ago, he worked for five years at the UK Met Office in Dynamics Research and Dynamical Core Development. He did his postdoc for five years at the University of Cambridge and received his PhD from Harriet Watt University, Edinburgh. He has currently more than 50 published articles and more than 800 citations. Uh, his current interests resolve around the numerical simulation of atmospheric and non coastal flows, dynamical core development, physics dynamics coupling, and wind and ocean renewable energy. So uh, impressive uh, biography of Dr. Marcus Groffs. Uh, we are very happy having you here. So uh, the flat is yours, Marcus. Thank you very much, Oswaldo. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, introduction and uh, for the opportunity uh, to present uh, our work here in this workshop. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's my pleasure to talk to you today about our experience with controlled mesoscale experiments and their inherent uncertainty and how machine learning, which we've already heard lots about uh, this morning, can come to the rescue or help us, in other words, uh, with making predictions uh, of uh, wind resources. I want to start also uh, backwards with the acknowledgements because I usually run out of time and then the acknowledgements usually come too short. Uh, they are, of course, important contributions uh, from other people. Uh, and the most two important are uh, like, uh, Dr. Vanessa Maga here from CISESA, uh, who works with me in the same department and uh, Dr. Alfredo Peña uh, from DTU, who works with us on the uh, MIVA project, uh, which is funded by DANIDA, which is a Danish uh, research and development agency. And we uh, benefited uh, from funding from the LNS, which is the Laboratorio Nacional uh, de la Sur Oeste, uh, uh, the supercomputing, uh, the supercomputer, uh, the, the Sur Oeste de, de Mexico. <laughs> Uh, where we ran uh, most of our WARF simulations. The motivations for this talk is um, basically, uh, it's essential to research potential sites well before embarking on any campaign, let it be measuring campaign, or uh, uh, of course, uh, even more so if you want to actually put concrete into the, uh, into the, into the ground. Yeah? In the first instance, this is done with models because we can move our models around without any problems, no permits required. Uh, and uh, if it goes wrong, then uh, nobody knows about it. There are some things we know well, uh, like the orography, at least we think we do. <laughs> and uh, there are others which we already know that we don't know them so well, like, for example, uh, the surface roughness. Uh, which uh, is uh, often uh, implemented uh, rather crudely in the models. The maps have low resolution uh, and uh, have no seasonality, etc. And it's, uh, well, you could say it's a bit of a guesswork uh, on uh, what the exact or what the implemented value there really is. And then, of course, uh, we know it's uh, really crudely measured, and we know it's important uh, because it uh, impacts directly on the boundary layer and the development of the boundary layer. Uh, but what is its relative importance to all the other unknowns in the model, and also in relation to these which we think we know well, like the orography? OK, I hope that this becomes a little bit clearer throughout the talk. Uh, but uh, I hope I have illustrated the gist of it. Uh, uh, the orography we are using uh, comes uh, from the ELOS Global Digital, Digital Surface Model, uh, which is a Japanese uh, data source. And it has uh, quite high resolution, about 30 meters in the horizontal. And it's uh, derived from an even higher resolution 5 meter data set. So we can be uh, quite certain that this is a good data source and that it represents uh, the orography uh, in the site well. Now, of course, uh, having good data to come in is one thing. What you do with it is another. 
And uh, that is uh, the, uh, the representation in the model. We don't run our models at five uh, meter resolution. We don't run our models at 30 meter resolution. Even though the data set comes at these, five, uh, at these five resolutions, the model doesn't run at them. So we have to do something with the data to put it into the model. And that's where the problem starts. Uh, this is just uh, an illustration, just uh, like a 1D cut through the, through the data. On the y-axis, you see uh, the elevation height, and on the uh, x-axis, just distance. And I've illustrated here some other, some imaginary orography uh, and uh, some imaginary grid points on them. And uh, this is uh, what I've called the bad luck. Uh, uh, scenario uh, where the grid points uh, do not really capture the complexity of uh, this uh, real orography. This trench in the middle there is not existent in the model. The model just sees the model as a horizontal surface. And uh, as we know, uh, that's not good for representing the wind well. Now I've got here a second example, which is better. Uh, because at least the one grid point falls exactly into the valley there in the middle. Uh, but if you're honest, this is just by luck. Nobody goes through the model and inspects every one and uh, one single grid point and sees that they are really uh, in uh, the uh, most optimal position. We uh, define a resolution, we define a location, and uh, let the model do the rest. No? No. And then interpret our orography data set and hope that it works well. Hmm? And so this is just by luck that it works well here. Uh, and uh, so there is a certain degree of uh, uncertainty, a certain degree of risk associated with uh, your orography data set, even though we thought we know it so well. We've got such good data sources for it. The roughness, uh, now there are different databases available. MODIS is one of the most uh, popular ones. Uh, they rarely have high resolution, uh, neither spatial uh, or temporal. And uh, they often use discrete values, like surface classes, surface types. And then uh, you try to uh, force uh, the uh, uh, whatever you observe on the ground into one of these classes, which may fit well or may, not, may fit not so well, because uh, there are only a, a limited number of classes 20, 30 classes, something like that, uh, a really low value, considering that it meant, it's meant to be, represent all the different vegetation and, uh, and roughness types on the whole planet, not just in your domain. Uh, then there's a question, what is topography and what is roughness? Which uh, roughness element is so large that it should really be counted as topography, like a very large boulder, uh, and uh, which, uh, Topography is so small uh, that it should really be uh, seen as roughness because uh, we run a model at what five kilometer resolution? A five kilometer boulder is nearly a small hill. No, it's not really a boulder anymore. So, um, that uh, even though a boulder, like a big rock, would be seen as roughness element, but if it's five kilometer large, it should really go into topography. So, it's not really so clear cut uh, how we consider the one or the other in the model. And as well, we mostly just rely on uh, let the model decide by luck, more or less. And uh, then there are problems in uh, deriving roughness uh, because it's uh, usually derived uh, from remote sensors. Uh, and uh, as we know, remote sensors, they also have a very uh, distinct view of uh, the world, mostly uh, from uh, several hundred kilometers away. And uh, there are clouds in the way uh, and uh, all the things we can imagine. And uh, it's uh, not that straightforward to actually uh, match surface roughness signal with other signals, other noise factors in the remote sensing. In this project, uh, we uh, use a set of WARF runs. We've got three different orography data sets. Uh, one where we evaluate uh, just the source at a grid point. We smooth the orography. We artificially roughen the orography. I will say more about it in a second. And we average uh, the orography around the grid point. 
to see uh, how that affects uh, the wind resource predictions. And we use four different roughness fields. We use this uh, standard MODIS. Um, uh, we derive a roughness field uh, from ESA data, from the European Space Agency. And uh, we use uh, the same ESA field, but add a one standard deviation to it. Uh, and then uh, we use, uh, so it's rougher. Uh, and uh, we use uh, the same uh, ASR derived field and subtract one standard deviation from it to make it smoother. And of course, we've got a control run where we just let WARF do its thing. Um, one run covers one week uh, and uh, we uh, run every four weeks uh, over a whole year to sort of cover uh, the whole different seasons. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, with the high resolution runs, we couldn't run every week of the year for uh, resource reasons, uh, but uh, every four weeks seems a good compromise. Uh, we analyze uh, the forecast performance uh, uh, against the uh, MetMast. Uh, so we use uh, the MO1 mast from the Mexican Wind Atlas, which already has been spoken uh, a lot about this morning as well. A very popular and famous data set. Uh, very useful, uh, and uh, we uh, compare our forecasts for this uh, against this data. And the metrics we use is uh, EMD or Wasserstein distance, so the Earth movers distance, as it was already introduced earlier. Uh, uh, CAE, uh, the normal peak correlation, uh, root mean square error, uh, root mean square errors, and bias in the model data. This is our site, our study site. This is the Uma Rosa here uh, in uh, Mexico. Uh, for those of you uh, who are not uh, uh, from Mexico or not from this part of Mexico, here is the Uma Rosa, uh, close to the border to the United States. Uh, you can't see my mouse cursor, unfortunately. But uh, let me see, uh, change it to a pen and make a big circle around that area. Uh, uh, so we've got here all the mountains uh, from Baja California. Here uh, we've got the Pacific. And here uh, we've got uh, uh, somewhere on the bottom here, uh, we'll start the Gulf of California at some point. Uh, and so uh, a very uh, diverse region in terms of uh, forcings, uh, temperatures, uh, and uh, therefore in the end wind. This is the uh, MetMast we are using, uh, the MO1 MetMast. Uh, uh, all the data is and the uh, detailed descriptions uh, are available here uh, from Enel. Um, and it has more data available than what is used in, in this project. We only used one year here, but it has data from 2017 to 2020, so a very useful data set. Our input data uh, is derived from the HRRR, the High Resolution Rapid Refresh uh, Model. It runs at three kilometer resolution. Uh, and so it's great. It gives us high, re high resolution data for free. All we need to do is just download it. Uh, it's, uh, it uses uh, lots of data simulation. It simulates every 15 minutes. Uh, and uh, also has additional uh, radar data simulation from a 13 kilometer uh, mesh every hour. So this is a very uh, good data source already. And uh, our location here, uh, I in the paint. Uh, here we are, is uh, reasonably within the domain. So uh, you wouldn't want to be here at the boundaries no? because uh, there the model lecture will be no good. Uh, but here we are already reasonably into the model uh, that uh, we can say we can benefit from this uh, model. Okay, we use uh, basically uh, the NEVA configuration. That is a new European wind atlas. Um, now we only use a different radiation parameterization because the original uh, proposal in NEVA is too expensive at our resolutions. Uh, and uh, we also change uh, the boundary layer scheme uh, slightly. Uh, we've got a high uh, vertical resolution. We've got 61 levels. And these 61 levels are focused uh, towards the surface, uh, whereas uh, 
traditional weather forecasting uh, wouldn't really focus the levels there because there is no weather happening there. <laughs> the weather happens high up, uh, but for us, the wind happens there. This is the wind we are interested in. We are not interested in the wind uh, that high up where the weather happens. Uh, so we can't just use a normal weather vertical grid uh, in order to for wind energy uh, forecasting. The control model has 1.6 kilometer uh, resolution in the horizontal. We run a high resolution run, which we call HR from here onwards, which has 185 meters and a low resolution one, which has 6.6 .6 kilometer resolution. So here we are really uh, temporarily interpolating uh, the model later dynamically. We are not really adding resolution to it. Uh, we are rather taking resolution away. The uh, HRR runs at three kilometers. So uh, we can't say that we add anything in terms of resolution to this run. No? But it will be useful, as you'll see. Uh, we've got 241 by 241 grid points, no cumulus parameterization because the resolution is so well below that. Uh, uh, careful with the shallow convection, but that's a different issue. Uh, and we use a generally a five second time step. So uh, that's the acoustic uh, limitation, which is uh, biting us here in Wolf, but uh, we have to live with that. Uh, these are the references uh, for the uh, European uh, Wind Atlas and for details about the model configuration. Anybody is interested in reading any more about it? These are the excellent, the best sources you can get uh, for information about it and data. Uh, all the name lists are there to run it. Here I compare uh, the WARF versus the high HRRR topography. Uh, uh, depends, depending on which device you are following us, you may or may not be able to see any difference, but I assure you it's there. It's uh, much grainier here, for example, than it's here. Here it's all smooth uh, in the wharf and in the HRR, uh, there is more detail. Here we compare uh, our wharf at DO3, that's our highest resolution, 185 meters. Uh, versus the DO1, uh, the 1.6 kilometers. You can see there are lots of details uh, which are in the high resolution data set, uh, uh, which are not really represented at all uh, in the low, low resolution one. And you would think this clearly must be so much better. No? Okay, we'll come to that. I'm sure I don't run out of time. Um, and here we've got uh, the comparison of all three together. Ideally, we would, run, uh, we would like to run an ensemble, an ensemble of topographies, uh, just some randomly perturbed with some standard, uh, with some uh, um, probability density function, uh, which represents uh, the site. But uh, it would be very expensive to run an ensemble, which would be large enough to produce meaningful data. So we have to do something else. So what we do is we uh, try to generate topographies with surrealistic bounds, however, with substantial differences. How, we do, how do we do that? We evaluate min, max, and average in a circular area around every grid point now over the whole domain. Then we generate the smoothest curve possible uh, while the surface is defined uh, by min and max, uh, between the surfaces de are defined by min and max. Now this will create the smooth topography. Then we intersect this topography uh, with the exact topography and extend the extremes to the min and max curves. And from that, we interpolate the new orography, uh, orography to the mesh points. So lots of words. Here are some, uh, here's a graphic which hopefully describes that better. Uh, you see the uh, original uh, orography here and uh, the max and min in each grid point, uh, 100 meters radius. Uh, now uh, around each grid point with 100 meters radius. So that's how we define the min and max surfaces. And then uh, we sort of uh, put a string in it and pull it uh, so that it's uh, the smoothest possible, bounded, for example, here you can see, by the extreme surfaces. That defines the smoothest. As I said, then we intersect uh, the smoothest uh, orography with the real one. We get these intersection points here. Here, uh, red on red doesn't mean you can see it very well, but these are the intersection points now. Then we search for the local extrema in between the intersection points. And if it's a 
maxima, we lift it up towards uh, the maximum curve. And if it's a minima, uh, we push it down towards the minimum curve. And this gives us an, uh, the roughest, uh, a rough topography, which however is bounded um, by the real data. So it is potentially a realization of a suitable uh, interpolation of the real data. If the grid points just happen to fall on this specific location. Okay. Uh, here are the uh, examples. Uh, we've got uh, the average here, the smooth and the rough. Again, depending on your resolution, you may or may not see the difference. Uh, that's why I provide you here with a difference plot as well. They can clearly see the difference. Here, uh, 150 to minus 200 meters difference, uh, 100 minus 100 meters, and uh, here even more in the rough one, 250 ish, 300 to minus 300, 320 meters. So there's a substantial difference uh, in those data sets. And you can also see that uh, this uh, definitely here looks smooth and this looks rather rough and this is somewhere in between, which fits the titles. The roughness uh, is uh, defined uh, from the ERSR data, uh, ERSR position images, which have uh, great resolution, 12.5 meter pixel size. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, which is lots of data, 125 megabyte uh, per, uh, uh, per image. And uh, we then need to post-process it. We need to correct it uh, for the satellite trajectory, correct it for orography effects, correction for speckle effects. And eventually we can evaluate uh, the backscatter. Uh, and uh, this backscatter uh, can then be related to roughness just by an empirical relation, uh, which uh, doesn't always hold, but it's uh, a good guess, let's say. No? Uh, we don't claim it to be accurate, but uh, it's uh, definitely a good alternative. Here, I show you some uh, illustrations here on the left, uh, this one here, uh, you see uh, the MODIS data. And you can very clearly say, see they use classes. They are only about what, five or so distinct uh, values here because uh, the, um, the roughness data is forced to be conformed with these surface types, uh, surface classes. And here in this one, uh, you can see that I've inserted our satellite data. Here you can, oh, sorry, I need to go back. Here you can see uh, this uh, transition to a new data set. But however, you can see also some similarity. Uh, uh, this area here, is sort of represented here, just with much higher resolution. And uh, we add here this mountains, which are there. And they are very rocky mountains, very rough mountains. So it makes sense that they show up as high roughness. And this one is the one where we add a one standard deviation to the model, uh, to the data. And here is where we subtract one standard deviation. You can see that on average, it's smooth, uh, it blends in better. Uh, which uh, seems reasonable. And uh, these points appear here, which is where we would end up with a negative uh, roughness, which of course is not possible. Uh, so we have to limit uh, the data set uh, to exclude uh, negative or zero values in the roughness field. But it's a technicality. Uh, what does it look like over time? Here I've got just uh, the data evaluated at the grid point and plotted over uh, the whole time series, we've got data from 1999 to 2010. And you can see uh, there is a reasonably large spread of the data from 0 0.1 to uh, 1.1, it's massive. Um, I think I can see that there's an average in here, which goes about here, uh, 0 0.38, but uh, you may argue. Uh, but uh, Clear trends, uh, a seasonality, um, I don't really see. Uh, maybe some analysis would be able to uh, filter out the winters to the summers, but there's not so much uh, seasonality in the area. I mean, sometimes there's snow on the ground, sometimes not, but that's really the main difference. There's not uh, massive vegetation growing in the summer and then disappearing in the winter or something like that. Uh, so yeah, I think you can assume it to be rather constant in this site. But, 
Um, so yeah, uh, here is just in words again uh, that uh, from this data set uh, we uh, generate these three versions, average, average plus standard deviation, and uh, the limited version of the average minus standard deviation. How much does it cost to run the WARF model? Always an important question because it limits us, unfortunately. The 1.6 kilometer version, uh, seven days of forecast, uh, approximately take one day of computation. We use 24 cores in parallel. Uh, that means 576 CPU hours. The 185 meters, much more resolution, uh, uh, takes 5.5 days uh, for one week using four times 24 cores. So that means uh, it's about 12,000 uh, CPU hours. And this on a non-commercial basis translates to about 12,000 pesos. And uh, why do we only use four nodes and not more? Well, because that's the maximum efficiency. If you were to use more, it would cost more uh, because we use more nodes uh, and uh, the time doesn't decrease uh, with the use of more. The time does decrease, but does not decrease in an efficient way. So we would get it maybe in uh, four days, but we would need to use twice as many uh, CPUs or something like that. Uh, so it wouldn't make sense in terms of uh, eco economy. It's uh, better for us to wait. So coming to the results, uh, here is a typical time series of the wind speed. You can see it's more or less, uh, agree they all agree with each other, more or less. If you zoom in, uh, here you have the observation in blue. Uh, try to, uh, there we are, a definite click. Uh, the observation in blue. And here you see uh, some families, uh, like three families if you want, no? of different uh, model configurations, which uh, uh, in this case here uh, deviate a lot from the observations. And in other cases, are more or less in agreement with the observations. And here, also, all three families are in agreement with the observations, whereas here, all three are very far away from the observations. We use some wind rosettes uh, to plot uh, the distribution of the direction of the wind speed. And here, I've got the observation over the uh, over a satellite image of the site. And we can see this bimodal distribution, uh, which is uh, not uh, uncommon uh, in uh, wind energy applications because the orography forces the wind in dominant uh, directions. And here you've got uh, the results uh, from uh, different model configurations. I have to watch my time, but I think I'm still good. Uh, here you've got the observations. Uh, we see that all the runs uh, are more or less uh, produce similar results. The HRR, uh, here we are, uh, has uh, a directional error. Uh, but this is the input data. But mostly all of the model runs uh, reduce this directional error and redistribute uh, the, uh, the wind direction uh, to uh, the right sectors. There are small differences in between all of these, but uh, as well, lots of similarity. And uh, hardly any of these uh, uh, get this sector right. Uh, uh, as to our scores for evaluating uh, the model, we use this graph a lot uh, where we have our seven days of uh, the forecast run. We have our weeks of the year, and you see every fourth week, uh, uh, of the year is present. We evaluate the score uh, for each day. Uh, so we have here the uh, average error for day seven. Then we evaluate the average error for the whole week. Uh, so this is not the average of the averages, this is the average of the whole week, which is a different, uh, different for a nonlinear metric. Uh, and then here uh, we've got the average of the weeks. So this is an average of an average, which is the average of this column, which goes into this box. And here we've got the average uh, of all of the uh, respective days. So again, an average of an average. So all of these, this column collapses into this one. Okay, and here's what it looks like, the control run. 
We've got the, uh, the uh, mean uh, ESA orography, uh, the mean minus standard deviation, mean plus standard deviation, uh, modified height mean field, modified height smooth, modified height rough, and modis. And here HHRR80, uh, the input data. Or the, yes, the input data, exactly. Evalu evaluated at our site. You see, they all agree. Uh, all of these have this uh, outlier here. Uh, and uh, with your um, bare eyes, you would be able to see uh, which one of these is really better or worse. Um, and so we have to uh, put them next to each other and ideally do different maps. So uh, that's why we use uh, here uh, the last row uh, which I explained, explained earlier, and we put it here. And now we've got here all the different model configurations. And now we can as well see for uh, for the angular error, uh, they are more or less all uh, the same. Some interesting. Uh, daily variation, uh, why day two is such an outlier. Uh, uh, and then uh, day five again, there's no physical meaning to day two and day, day five. So that's quite interesting. There must be some something building up in the model, uh, which then drives this error. We have to look into this in more detail. But all these model configurations more or less show the same. And here you've got uh, the earth, mo earth movers distance. We observe the first differences here, that the mean minus standard deviation uh, comes out best, at least uh, in the average, and more difficult to see here uh, in, uh, in the day-to-day -day differences. That is uh, definitely, it's more yellow here. Hopefully your screen's represented well. Uh, we've got the Pearson correlation, uh, more or less, uh, all, all the same across the runs, uh, nothing stands out particularly. Root mean square error uh, as well. Uh, it is not really that different. Now the bias uh, here, we see uh, a big difference. Uh, I guess partly because of the definition of the bias, it stands out more, but uh, the, the uh, satellite derived roughness definitely makes a difference. It's rougher, so it's not surprising that uh, it produces a lower or negative bias if all of the others have a positive bias. But the bias is also lower. Um, we have got here uh, about uh, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, no? and uh, it, we only go to about uh, minus 0 0.3 here. So definitely the roughness makes a difference here. And uh, here, uh, the difference between these two plots is that uh, here we've got a 10 minute data, which allows us to include the hourly data, which allows us to, which allows us to include the uh, driving model, the HHR80, which is 80 meter height, not 80 kilometer resolution as somebody previously thought. It's three kilometer resolution, 80 meter height. Uh, in the 10 minute, we don't have that anymore because the data doesn't come at that frequency. Yeah, but uh, uh, the uh, results are the same, even using 10 minute data. Turbulence intensity, always an interesting measure. Uh, uh, we see that uh, using uh, here the 12 hourly data, uh, we match the observations uh, really well. Uh, uh, this is Worf uh, here on the right, and this is the observation. And this is the error. So the error is really low. No? Uh, you can say, well, Worf, well done uh, for 12 hourly data. Um, uh, so I suppose uh, that's really something to keep in mind. Because if you look at uh, real turbulence, uh, now we look at six hourly data, hourly data, and now it already gets worse. Now look at this graph here on the right. Uh, it shoots up 50% error already at 10 meters per second, which is something which interests us. So Wolf is really losing it. Uh, and 10 minutes, uh, it's uh, gone. No, it's 80% uh, or more error. And we, are, we see there's really something missing here, uh, which uh, there should be something there. So uh, Wolf has, uh, cannot reproduce this data. 
And uh, you may ask yourself, uh, but do we at least have a diurnal cycle? Uh, yes, we do sort of have a diurnal cycle. Here you can see it goes down and goes up. And here as well, with good will, it goes down and then it goes up. But then you look at these and you say, wow, well, there's a factor of 10 difference here. No? Uh, this is really bad. Uh, so uh, some physics seems to be there, but it's by far not strong enough. Um, we try to explain this here. Now, why is that? Uh, we produce this graph that is currently still under review. I would like to give you the reference, but hopefully, uh, if you contact me later this year, hopefully I can. Uh, if you have fluctuations uh, below uh, 10 minutes at five meter, uh, every fluctuation below 10 minutes at five meter per second wind speeds are filtered out if you use an effective bridge resolution of three kilometers. Uh, and uh, as you go further to the right, it gets even worse no? No, with higher wind speeds. So this is how you're supposed to use this graph. Uh, uh, 10 minute fluctuations of five meter per second strength. So you look at the intersection of these two lines and then you've got uh, your filter, uh, uh, your grid length here, uh, which defines this filter. Well, I use the other way around. You've got your grid length and uh, your wind speeds and you see uh, what you filter out. And you see, you see that you filter out uh, everything of uh, 10 minute length scale or below. So eight minutes, nine meters, uh, nine minutes, etc. So this is really bad uh, because a lot of interesting physics and a lot of interesting wind happens there. And if you look back at this, I mean, 10 minutes, you may say it doesn't interest me for wind uh, turbines because they don't re can't react fast enough anyway. Uh, but uh, hourly, uh, uh, I think uh, we, would, we would still be interested in that because hourly, surely the wind turbine will react to hourly fluctuations. Okay. Here I've got some uh, uh, turbine intensity scatter plots. The observations, definitely a lot of things here. The high resolution model can sort of pick that up, but only at low wind speeds. Uh, at high wind speeds, uh, all of this area here, sorry for the red on red, uh, is absolutely missing here. And the low resolution doesn't stand a chance. No, there's absolutely nothing here. And uh, the bottom end here is far too populated, where uh, according to observations, there shouldn't be anything there. And uh, I say it's obvious, but uh, here you see uh, uh, for the high wind speeds or filter length scales, uh, or filter time scales, uh, depending on what interests you, uh, are much higher. That's when uh, the model has even less chance of uh, filling in uh, this space here. Okay, comparing high resolution experimental and control. What does high resolution bring us? Here is high resolution. Uh, errors are worse. EMD is uh, not significantly improved. Uh, uh, keep in mind that these uh, models cost uh, orders of magnitude more to run. So you, you would have really uh, hoped to see here uh, significant improvements, but they are just not there. Sometimes they are better, sometimes not. Uh, as you can see here, uh, there's uh, blue and red right next to each other. Uh, and then we've got here uh, uh, some lighter colors uh, where we say, okay, uh, here it's possibly better, but uh, then look to the left of it and it's absolutely horrific. Or uh, in this one, Pearson correlation, day two, all white, uh, great, <laughs> but day one, all red, and oof, what's going on there? And uh, the other days are uh, in dark colors as well. No? All this investment uh, into the high resolution run and really no benefit from it. No, machine learning, nonlinear regression, we use a low resolution wharf run at 6.6 .6 kilometer. Super easy to run. I, I run a year uh, in our workstations here, uh, maybe in a week or something. I don't remember. It was so insignificant. Uh, I just ran it on the side. Uh, on the side, uh, I ran a complete year, trained for 20, 52 weeks, uh, all the weeks in separation, uh, always in, excluding the week of, week of interest in the training. 
the ReLU activation, two layers, 64 by 1024, and input and output layers. Uh, for those who want to have the details, uh, happily provide more. And here are the results, which are really interesting us. Uh, the low resolution run obviously has the worst results and bias, but unexpected because it's a low resolution run. We all know low resolution is bad. The high resolution uh, has improved on the control a little bit, 0.4 to 0.3. Okay, great for all that money. No? <laughs> and but machine learning uh, is a slight echo, but okay. Machine learning uh, uh, scored a, uh, a straight zero. So the cheapest model, the by far best result. Looking at the root mean square error, it's a uh, similar message. Uh, even more intriguing, perhaps, because the high resolution model has nearly the worst error, just uh, a little bit better than the low resolution model, 2.1 versus 2.4. The control even scores 1.9, and the high the uh, the input data scores a two uh, back back, scores a two. Uh, so the input data is better than the high resolution model. So we can just download the data. No need to run a model. Mm. Um, but using the machine learning, we can improve on all of those and uh, score a nice 1.7 here uh, in the root mean square error. These are all, uh, all the root mean square errors are absolute errors, so this is 1.7 meters per second, which I think is good enough. Uh, who contributes uh, to uh, the model performance? Uh, we use uh, a fair number, possibly arguably too many um, model variables, variables to train the model. Uh, the magnitude of the wind speed at level one is one of the highest scorers. Uh, and uh, there are some temperature and some directionalities. There's a lot of duplication here because we evaluate uh, the data at different levels and we feed it into the model, uh, into the machine learning model. Uh, and so the model has to decide, do I use this or the other? So it splits, it's relative importance over the variables, which all behave in a similar way. So even if there's a lower score here, it can be misleading because eliminating one of the two variables which behave in the same way would double the uh, significance of that variable in the one which, which we keep in. So we have to uh, be a bit more selective here, uh, but you can clearly see uh, Magnitude at level 15, magnitude at level one, and surface temperatures uh, are sort of driving the model success. And clouds less so, no? as uh, you would possibly expect. Um, in conclusion, uh, I think, still good on time. Uh, the runs with one kilometer resolution improved predictions compared to the high resolution rapid refresh, the input data. Turbulence is too weak. The model just does not resolve it. The effect of roughness fields uh, is similar to that of alternate topographies. Uh, so you could argue uh, that, yes, it's important, uh, but there are other errors uh, which are equally important. So you can't really single it out as being the one single most important uh, shortcoming of your model, say. Um, some metrics are better using the uh, ESA roughness field. Uh, so there is, it's interesting to use the satellite data uh, to improve on the roughness. High resolution improves the results, but only slightly and can equally contribute to uh, errors at other times. Uh, so you've got improvements sometimes uh, and then uh, high resolution errors at other times. Um, yeah, other scores uh, are sometimes better, sometimes worse with higher resolution. It's not, can't say uh, you need high resolution and that's all you need. No, high resolution does not solve everything. Uh, but it certainly makes things more expensive. Uh, the error increases until day seven, slightly. I've not really seen any need uh, to overlap uh, simulations uh, to exclude spin up or to exclude uh, the uh, areas where the uh, forecast error has accumulated excessively. Uh, the artificial intelligence model is very promising and uh, 
So you'll be working on generalizing uh, with modern so it can be applied to different sites. Uh, do some site analysis uh, and see which site parameters uh, feed into the model. So we can apply it to different sites without having to retrain it. That would be really useful. And hopefully uh, the other wind masts of uh, the Mexican wind atlas can uh, help us with that. Future direction, turbulence, as we all know, it's a big subject and a complex subject and definitely something which WARF isn't good at. Uh, I mean, that's where all this micro scale, uh, meso micro coupling comes from uh, because it's well recognized uh, that WARF alone, nah, it's just not good. Uh, implementing roughness directionality uh, in the micro scale models that's already done. It would possibly uh, be interesting to implement that in WARF. Uh, algorithmatic uh, improvement of, uh, of the representation of topography, i.e. an analysis, a feature analysis, which then drives uh, a decision on uh, which grid point to use of the topography would possibly be useful rather than just some uh, straight uh, out of the box interpolation. Um, uh, and uh, and the parameterizations of long duration bursts uh, to fill the gap in the spectrum. It would be interesting to have that. We have already gust parameterizations in the models, but gusts are usually much shorter scale, which doesn't don't really interest us from wind energy. But as we've seen uh, in sort of the 30 minute to one hour window, there is still data missing in the spectrum, which would be nice to have, which the model cannot resolve. I hope I have illustrated that. Uh, uh, and so we need to add, we need to put it in. And parameterizations is a way to go to put these things into these types of models. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, in the future, we need to analyze more the periods where Wolf got it wrong and to understand better why it got it wrong, what is the driving force there. Okay, and this concludes. I've lost track of time. I hope I'm still good. <laughs> Osvaldo is still sitting there patiently, so I guess I've not overrun horrifically. Um, I just want to acknowledge now again uh, the contribution from the LNS, uh, which was uh, very helpful. This computational time is uh, always an issue. So anyway, the high resolution runs, uh, even though we've now learned that uh, the high resolution maybe is not that helpful as uh, we always hope it would be. Okay, with that, uh, I conclude my presentation for today. I would be happy to take any answers, uh, any questions, <laughs> answers always. <laughs> I would be happy to take any questions and hopefully provide answers to them as well. Thank you very much, Marcus. Um, yeah, I was just about to use my scissors, but I didn't, right? Yeah, okay. So, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, please uh, use the reactions, give a huge applause to Marcus. Everyone, uh, please uh, raise your hand uh, if you want to make a question or if you want to provide an answer also to Marcus, you can do it. Um, please raise your, uh, feel free to raise, to raise your hand and uh, make the questions. Uh, here we have a question from Gustavo Hernandez. Hi, Marcus, very interesting presentation. I have two questions. Does the roughness change uh, with time? Do the roughness change with time? And why did you choose the ALOS data set? Yes, uh, I mean, roughness changes with time uh, because, uh, I mean, you can imagine uh, sites uh, where there's vegetation that grows in the summer or like here in Mexico, where the vegetation grows in the winter and then disappears in the opposing season. Uh, or you've got snow cover, which, uh, which drastically changes the roughness uh, compared to uh, the exposed rocks and boulders, uh, which you may have at other times. Uh, in our simulations, uh, we kept uh, the uh, roughness fixed so we didn't change it over time. But uh, usually uh, the models uh, adjust the roughness uh, with time um, based on uh, climatic assumptions. Or for example, on the sea, based on wind speed, the, the, the roughness uh, changes due to waves and the waves are uh, to a certain extent uh, a result of wind. And then uh, you have got this feedback, uh, wind, waves, roughness. Uh, and the models do consider that. 
Uh, but uh, here uh, for these experiments, uh, we kept it constant. We switched off all updating of roughness fields uh, so that we uh, were purely ev evaluating the effect of this particular roughness data set. Why did I choose the ALOS? Uh, because uh, uh, it's a nice high, re high, re high resolution data set. Uh, and uh, yes, I could have chosen uh, other high resolution data sets as well. No? But then I think with a five meter resolution, it's, uh, it's a very good source. Thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, if you have any other question, please raise your hand uh, to open your microphone or put it in the chat. We have a couple of minutes more. Okay, um, I, I have one, but I think it will be the last one. Um, indeed, I think that the most complex phenomena that you want to analyze is turbulence intensity, right? And um, there is a huge opportunity area uh, to implement these uh, machine learning methods. Have you thought of, have you, um, do you have a plan to in which specific areas can you implement other specific areas than uh, uh, turbulence intensity? Can you implement these models in the future? Have you have thoughts on your mind about this? Well, the machine learning has uh, the opportunity uh, to basically fill the gap in the spectrum uh, because it can. Uh, uh, take from the observations uh, the, um, the real variation of the wind and learn how the wind would behave at the site uh, under these conditions. Uh, and that includes the turbulence intensity. Um, yes. Uh, uh, so uh, machine learning would help there. Yeah? Uh, it would be able to, uh, to fill this. Uh, it would obviously not correct the model itself unless you would implement uh, then the machine learning uh, approach in the model itself. So any uh, turbulent mixing or something which you may want to have in the model, which is not existent because of the lack of turbulence, you would be able to introduce uh, retrospectively. But uh, uh, for me, uh, I think uh, the most pressing issue is to try to generalize, uh, to see uh, what sort of uh, analysis do we need to do uh, in the site? Uh, how can we generalize the site characteristics uh, so that the machine learning model can understand it and can then apply uh, the learned behavior of the wind to, uh, to new sites? Now, because uh, the problem we have is that we want to uh, evaluate the whole country, which is very large and very complex in all its detail. And uh, we can't uh, put mast yields, uh, we can't put masts everywhere <laughs> to try to get the data to train our model and then later say, okay, now we've got a good model, which tells us that there's a good site where we already had a mast. <laughs> so yeah, we would like to, uh, the model to be able to, uh, to estimate it itself. And uh, yeah. yeah, I totally agree with you. So 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 thank you thank you Marcus for your presentation